I'm Austin, and this is Rodrigo. How's it going, everybody? So we're going to sort of commentate over uh, me catting this, and these are some of the dimensions of the hoverboard motor. These are all in millimeters, and I'm going to switch over into millimeters here in a second with this uh, CAD software. So, uh, Rod, what um, I know that you're kind of like looking into uh, Fusion 360 a little bit more. Um, tell me what your experience is with catting in general. I'm liking it so far. Um, so my background primarily when it comes to CAD revolves around um, SolidWorks. I started off Pro Eep, then I moved over to SolidWorks. Uh, this is my first time trying Fusion 360. I downloaded the, the sample or no, the trial version and I messed around with it a lot. Um, and after going through a tutorial that is specifically tooled for like SolidWorks users, um, I started playing with it. I like it. I honestly have not had that much time on it, but I'm liking all the features so far. I, it's not that much different from what I'm used to. Just for some background info, I mean, me and Rodrigo go back a long time ago. Uh, how long have we known each other? Like mm. since two, uh, must have been. It's like 2013 started, or 2013, yeah, yeah. 2014. That sounds right. about right. Um, and you've been a mechanical engineer. Um, in college, that was your bachelor's. Correct. Uh, same with me, although I kind of took a little bit different path out of uh, out of college. I started doing more software, but I was going to say, did you ever announce that over the, your videos? Like uh, what's the background is? Yeah, I've alluded to it. I've mentioned a lot about mechatronics. Um, so, you know, some some people. I think a lot of uh, viewers, most of my viewers right now, do come from mechatronics, actually. Right. But um, uh, yeah. It, the funny thing was I couldn't get software people to save my life really to help on the vehicle. And we had enough mechanical engineers and you were one of the lead engineers for uh, the mechanical division in mechatronics. So I felt that was pretty well covered. So um, I kind of bit the bullet and went with software engineering. And so uh, here we are. Um, but, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll do some catting. I'm not an expert by any means, but uh, here's, I guess, my best attempt at trying to do some of this stuff. I remember some of this stuff. We had to, as a mechanical engineer, had to like take, what was it, a year of catting? I yeah. think you it did- was two semesters of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did that as well, right? Because I know that you transferred in units for catting as well, right? That's correct. So in, uh, at an internship, I got a chance to use Anovia or Katia and Anovia. So I got some cat experience there and then in community college, I learned SolarWorks, and when I transferred over to San Diego State, uh, all that stuff just came through and got yeah. really lucky. Yeah, that's nice. You didn't really have to take those classes again. I only had to take the second semester. The professor let me skip the first semester. Just oh, really? Oh, you took the second? Had. Okay. And that was SolarWorks and Creo, basically. The other. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Creo's kind of it's kind of dead now. I don't really know anybody who uses that anymore. I had heard so it's still around the last thing i heard was mm -hmm. that creo um had actually bought um on shape oh yeah whoa yeah, i had yeah, no yeah. idea about that I, either they merged with them or they bought them i'm not too sure but that was like one of the last wow. bits i heard um that came that little detail came directly from my lead at work so i was actually surprised as well i had the yeah, exact yeah. same reaction wow back in the game i guess yeah, <laughs> yeah, i know we're trying to at least so uh here I'm just trying to like, there's a little, I guess, what do you call it? A keyed section. There's a little shaft over there with the, we, we have the motor here. We're looking at it. Um, there's a little keyed section that I'm trying to create here. So um, this is ultimately going to be the shaft that comes out uh, normal to the motor's center. Right, right. right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, what I was taught in, in catting classes is, is to sort of do uh, fillets last and do chamfers dead last. That which, that always kind of stuck with me. Which I'm terrible at. I have to be honest. I have years of experience with cat and I just can't help it sometimes. <laughs> I'll just throw in a fillet or a chamfer because yeah, yeah. it just looks so nice. What's the, I mean, like, this is very simple compared to some of the catting stuff that you do. Um, what is some of the more advanced stuff that you've, that you've done with the uh, catting? Um, I mean, so at this point, uh, I've been doing CAD since maybe 2008. I'm by no means an expert, but I've been using it in class, in the club, and also work. 
Um, I've done everything from your, you know, your simple go-to brackets, your enclosures, you know, uh, even tooling. Um, the, I think the craziest thing, I, you know, it's funny cause like I'm actually cons- thinking about it from a 3d printer perspective, right? A 3d yeah, printer yeah, yeah. approach. But in reality, I mean, we, I've catted things that we ended up using for the, for the glove. I, I remember you, uh, you definitely got into a phase where you, I, I don't know what it is. It's almost like you, once you get to a certain point, you realize, oh, just cause you can make it in CAD doesn't actually mean you can make it in real life. Less, so, big lesson number one that any mechanical engineer that has experience with CAD has to absolutely learn the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> you can make it in CAD and it can look awesome, but that does not mean you can actually in real life make it at least with, you know, using traditional means like a yeah. mill or right, a right. CNC machine. Uh, 3D printing is absolutely changing all that, but there's still a lot of um, details you have to take into account. Yeah, I, you know, when I took these CADing courses, I don't know if that was exactly taught to me. We were just given a book and like, you know, the professor said, hey, copy this in the book and try to make this. I, it never really went through my head like, okay, how I'm going to manufacture this is with a lathe or a CNC. And this is how, um, I'm going to kind of make this part. Mm-hmm. It, it, that never really clicked until later for me. Oh yeah. I was going to say, did you have to take, I forget what number it was at university, but did you have to take the mechanical or the manufacturing class where you actually yes. got hands on? Okay. Yes. Yes. But you know, it was very unfortunate because there were, there's a lot of people mm-hmm. in that class. Mm-hmm. And we had to share the mill. Right. So we had to take turns on sharing time the mill. Low. So right. yeah, I didn't like, okay, cool. We got turns like cranking the mill. Right. You know, and, exactly. and the X and Y axis. And like, it wasn't really fulfilling. Right. So I, w- what was your experience with that? So pretty much the exact same. Our class had, I want to say 40 more people than it was meant to. Yeah. So yeah, yeah uh, hands on right. time with the machine was very limited, but yeah. the specific detail that Austin is referring to really clicked in for, I want to say both of us when we joined the club and we actually started to design things for this, you know, autonomous robotic aquatic submarine that we participated with. And I mean, I, I got, you know, I fell flat on my face a couple of times when, um, it's a tough project. It's really t- <laughs> yeah when i would design some you know crazy looking enclosure and i was primarily driven by looks and then here comes our mentor and you know straight up tells me like how are you gonna machine that and you're like yeah. oh man so absolutely true for anyone who's attempting cat for the first time or really even at any point you the best approach to cat is to think about how you're even going to make it right i've been told like you kind of want to make it how you're going to manufacture it. Mm-hmm. Is that, is that like pretty accurate? Absolutely. Right. So for example, right? Like if I'm going to throw the simplest example I can think of, if you're going to create a pocket, so you got a, a billet block of aluminum uh, and you're going to create a pocket for some type of piece of hardware, like a board or something like that, mm-hmm. you have to, you, it, it's very good to consider what kind of bit, or uh, end mill, excuse me, you're going to be using to cut. So if you're gonna use a quarter inch or a three eighths, when you cut corners or when you're the, when you're cutting up the corners, it's good to throw in there a radius that matches the diameter of that end mill, right? Cause you just make everything way easier. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm still trying to get there with my own experience with this. Um, you make things easier for you. Cause like, for example, that, that pocket, right? Say you're creating a pocket for a motor or something like that. Mm. Uh, and it's got three, four corners. Um, if you make those corners, you know, the radius of your end mill, mm. you can go in there with a single operation and get right, that right, done right. immediately, as opposed to like changing up the radius and having to go in there with too many different operations with different end mills and so on and so on. Right. Uh, what I was doing before here was just a couple lofts to actually create the motor, which is, I don't know, probably intermediary sort of catting. Um, I think more advanced is doing stuff with like surfaces. And, Absolutely. And, That's and, top tier. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen crazy stuff being done with surfaces. I guess you can get pretty crazy with it. I'm trying to make the pattern here. I think there's, oh. a, there's a pattern on the, on the back of the motor. Um, and yeah. it was kind of weird to 
do that maybe one. here you can like overlay a picture of like the face of the motor right yeah yeah sure it's like yeah. neat looking enclosure for sure yeah Definitely and, you know actually so i, I was kind of shocked that i bought more of these motors are sitting over there and the pattern is different but when i bought it off of the site the pattern was the same so i was like that's i hope they're not different motors yeah, so i was gonna ask how okay so the first set of motors that you've got you got those yeah. directly from a hoverboard and you just took no them no, no so i only got one originally so this oh, was my okay. one that i originally had and i bought it because i always knew that i was going to be doing like a robo dog sort of thing <laughs> right i just never got around to it never had time but now i kind of have time so um and that was a while ago and I just had it in storage. I haven't really done much with it. And then um, I started picking up this project and then I felt like I uh, needed to buy like two more, but it's been months and months. So I was hoping that I could get the same exact ones. Right. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Cause like, I mean, it's, if you know you're gonna at least get two or three, you might as well buy them like immediately. Yeah. Just yeah. so that you don't get stuck with uh, crazy over your crazy lead times, right? Right. Um, and you know you're probably going to break one or two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that's, you know, I they seem to come in bundles of two. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'll have like a couple spares left over. I have three right now in total. So you bought it directly from the company that sells? No, I bought it from Amazon. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, I actually tried to buy the one that I bought months and months ago, but they were out of stock oh. for that particular, I guess, vendor. Uh, so I could buy them in pairs of two, but yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it all came from the same facility though, wherever it's being manufactured. Yeah, probably. Um, I just hope that there's no like major variations of motor characteristics and, uh, like, uh, batches that yeah. I get. Um, hopefully, I mean, there's probably some variations, but hopefully it's not that bad. Um, I don't, I, I'm going to try to hone in the accuracy of these motors, um, because you know how accurate you have to be with like robotics and like you put encoders on it and you have to be able to kind of accurately measure the, the positions and you can also like you can get crazy with it you can like get the um like resistance of the motor and stuff like that and that can be in your control system algorithms where you can kind of move the robot more fluidly um by knowing the stuff knowing this information and put it in the control systems but so i want to get your your opinion on this but mm -hmm. like so you i think your first entry into catting was purely solidworks correct yeah yeah so it was we started with solidworks but we also did creo too yeah we we did both um but i really didn't branch outside of that the only reason why i went to fusion 360 was almost sort of like necessity i didn't like a license for solidworks is so expensive Absolutely. um so, you want to say how much that is for context? Yeah, yeah. What? What? I don't even know what it is. Uh, they range, but at work, uh, one professional license with all the bows and ribbons, mm -hmm. FEA and stuff, e finite element analysis. E exactly. It comes out to about like ten grand a year. Ten grand a year. Yeah. yeah so that's... the <laughs> the simple base license, to my knowledge, it might be it might have changed by now, but it's about six thousand a year, maybe five. You know, but like that's a very stripped down version. But like the professional version we use at work with all the bells and whistles, that's what I meant to say, is about 10 grand, which is pretty crazy. And yeah. for anyone who's just trying to do this as a hobbyist, uh, that's actually one of the really awesome things about, um, you know, Fusion and all the other uh, CAD competitors that are coming about. Oh, nice pattern. Yeah, yeah, this I did a awesome. circular yeah, pattern. So yeah, yeah. Make it easy for yourself. patterns. And then you come in there with scissors and then you just kind of zip. <laughs> so, yeah, like you're. The, your workflow here looks exactly like what I do at work. Um, yeah. We can get into into some of those details later. But yeah, so for anyone who's like just still new to catting and, and all this information is out there and easily accessible, but there's several, I, I didn't mean for anyone to get discouraged when I said how much SolidWorks costs. <laughs> I would like you all to know that there's plenty of options out there, including, um, uh, you know, Fusion 360, but it's not limited to that. There's on Onshape. Onshape, now, right? Onshape yeah, yeah. is specifically web browser based, right? Yeah, that's crazy. Um, it seems like the future catting technologies are moving more towards like networking and sharing. Cloud based. Yeah, cloud based. Yeah, yeah. Right. The power of the cloud. Yeah. But um, makes sense. I mean, in these times. And I believe Fusion 360, even though it's more of a um, 
you know, you download, uh, you know, typical program where you download, you engage the .exe. Um, there's also functionality on here where you can use it web, uh, on a web browser, correct? Uh, I've seen that. Like, that was one of the promotional things yeah, that really the, drew me in. Maybe, I, th that could be. The only thing that I've done web-based with this is, like, a viewer. Mm -hmm. Like, I can, like, view these CAD models that I make on my phone. Right. I never try to, like, model anything on my phone, but... Right. Um, I, I, I should finish my point. It was just really quick. Like, mm -hmm. so for anyone that does want to get into CADing, um, Fusion, you know, like your base license goes for about 500 a year, breaks out about, you know, 40 bucks a month, which is not bad about a, like similar to like a gym membership. Yeah. Um, they're, they do deals all the time. Like I got very lucky when I, I got did my too. License. You, you told yeah. me about uh, a deal that was going on they for had, like three years. What was it? Oh, uh, well they had the license off for 33% and yeah. you know, so for like, um, you know, roughly for one year, it was like 300 bucks or three something. And then for the, th they had a package that included the license for Fusion for three years. And that yeah, was yeah. about 850, 870 bucks. Right. right. It, it was an awesome deal. I had to jump on it. Um, By the way, you don't have to pay to get Fusion 360. Yes. There, there's free versions out there. If so. you're a student, you are set. Also, even if you're just a hobbyist, really? there's, oh. yeah, you can get a free version that way. I mean, it doesn't have, you know, yeah. a lot of the strip down. Yeah, exactly. You have an error, Austin. And I do. Yeah. What is it? You'll, you'll see a lot of those. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember what I was doing. I think um, one of the things that's weird with holes is I've never been able to sort of like fix it. You know how you can fix like uh, sketches or things like that? I kind of have to make the sketch first and then use a, like a reference there in the top corner Correct. to, to kind of hone it in. But it's just sort of a reference it doesn't really lock in i don't know Ooh. um yeah yeah so i i uh man it like it really shows off those threaded holes real good yeah yeah i i made sure to do like a tapped hole and uh it doesn't really matter because i mean oh i should also mention the reason why i'm catting the motor in the first place is just to have a good reference for whatever i design with the motor it's not like i'm making this motor or anything like Correct. that and uh i sort of mentioned this in in a previous video but I'm not just down, like there's a lot of sites that you can go on like GrabCAD and like, I don't you probably know of many others that you can just download free CAD models. Correct. Um, but I didn't do that with this, mostly because um, I, I wanted to make the dimensions very accurate, but also uh, it's a learning experience. Correct. And I wanted to show people how, you know, I would sort of go through something like this. Um, yeah, so what Austin mentioned, um, GrabCAD is, uh, you know, kind of like a hobbyist website where people can upload, um, they create their profiles and they can upload models that they've made. Um, it's actually not a bad place to go and try and find models of things that you might be looking for. I've found things of like, for example, like I've I found like a Raspberry Pi model on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you just find electronics too. Motor models on there. You can even find, I even found a model of my car. Interesting. Yeah, like somebody yeah, there's just a lot of stuff straight up scanned uh, my car and it just uploaded it. But um, there is, a, I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head. If I remember later on during this uh, video, I'll mention it. But there's an awesome website that I actually used when we were in the club hmm. that is basically GrabCAD, but it's for um, companies. So, oh. so companies go on there and they just upload their models. Now... Hmm. Uh, it's not perfect because not everybody in the world is, is you know, associated with it, Yeah. yeah. with this website. Uh, so you won't find everybody on there. But for example, we used copious amounts of 80-20 rail mm, during, yes, the, uh, during the sub days. And, uh, and I found pretty much every single model I needed off of there. Um, I'll try and remember the site again before the, the video ends because it's an awesome resource. You just make an account and you're set. That's nice. I, I know another one, but it's more for like 3D printers. You can just mm -hmm. print stuff. It's called Thingiverse. Oh, I've heard of them, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've printed some stuff. From there. So yeah, like, I guess give us, yeah, like an overall breakdown. You kind of started to, right? Like, I guess we can yeah. get into like the, the previous questions that we brought up later. But so right now you are specifically designing the motor just mm -hmm. to use as a point of reference for all the other hardware and mechanical components that are gonna mount right, to right. it, right? Yeah, so just because I'm making it doesn't, just because I'm making it in CAD doesn't mean I'm like trying to make it in real life. I just wanna model something physically so that I can sort of match stuff up that I do wanna to create to that model. 
So onto this, you're going to have what I'm assuming, I know in your previous video, you mentioned that uh, the encoder that these things come with is awful, as you as Yeah, you yeah, said. very low resolution. So you're They're gonna, not made for what I'm trying to do. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So you're gonna create a new, uh, or sorry, you're gonna use another encoder. Yeah, And I'm absolutely. assuming you're gonna create like a bracket for it. Yeah. Uh, here it is. Hey, look at this thing. Oh, wow, this thing's way smaller than It's I very am. tiny, yeah. So it's AMS, right? Yep. Okay. Um, it's a magnetic encoder. That's why they come no. with a little magnet right there. So you just kind of... Oh, so it's basically a hall. It's like a magic sensor. wand. Okay, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, oh, but, it gets down here. Yeah, but it's um, diametrically... Diametrically opposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... We've like, used this at work. Have before. you? Yeah, they're pretty interesting. It's uh, less wear and tear, so that's sort of nice. Um, but... Uh, Okay, so you're gonna have a mounting bracket in the. Yeah. This mounting bracket is gonna go directly on the shaft, or like. No, well, okay, so this I'm still trying to work this out a little bit. That's where I was gonna put a hole right there okay. in the uh, on that center, face. right? And there's a shaft that comes that butts up right to that surface. Oh. Okay. And so I was gonna try to like maybe uh, glue or something. I mean, not not that uh, wonky, but. Uh, just for prototyping, I wanted to be able to somehow fix a magnet in, in a, you know, on the shaft somehow and then have the uh, encoder move or vice versa. Okay. Still trying to work it out. We'll, we'll see how it goes as, as we go along. So on the opposite, wait, where's the motor? Okay, so on 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 the face that's got the pattern just yep. underneath that surface, there's, there's a, a shaft. There's a shaft that uh, sticks out. Yeah, and it, it doesn't move. The okay. hub moves around it. Interesting. So that's what you want to try to do is you want to try to get an encoder. There's two pieces to the encoder, right? One that stays stationary and then one that moves. Mm -hmm. So you'd want to fix one to uh, some part that's stationary on the motor and then the other part to the thing that moves. So I was thinking of building uh, sort of like an enclosure around the motor and then fixing like the encoder or fixing the magnet in a certain spot okay. and then having the other uh, one turn as the hub turns. I see, okay. Um, it's kind of, th that's why I love CAD because it's hard to explain it uh, but it's a lot easier to just show someone and cat it. Correct. Um, now, are you going to cat up that shaft on, in this model that you're currently making? Uh, oh, you're making new views. Nice. Yeah. So it's something very interesting in Fusion 360. It's everything's one file, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have encountered this, but I kind of have to do like new components and that kind of makes things opaque. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's kind of hard to... If you try to go and make a model without making new components and at least somewhat knowing what you're trying to do, it's gonna be very hard to do things later on. Um, I found that out the hard way. So just real quick question, just yeah. as uh, coming from, ooh, coming from. Um, this is the adapter part, by the way. Oh, so okay. So making the adapter, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So you're okay. I see what you meant by new component. So you're just making a new component within yes. this file. I so see. there's an adapter right there, and then inside of the adapter, there's two components. There's a base and there's a top because I know I'm going to be printing those separately. Mm. Um, it's just kind of easier to grab the files and print them that way. And they yeah. are two separate parts, so I made them two separate components. You got your counter saying, and you can separate those out in software, right? Like you can save them individually as mm -hmm. like the motor and the adapter. Yeah, Similar. you can save as STL file and then export it out to a printer. So when you started doing that, or, or sorry, when you started working on the adapter, does the motor part automatically go uh, translucent? Or is yes. that, okay, that's um, really neat. However, I've done this several times. If you don't select the component that you're working with, mm. you put whatever you're making in that, that other component. So oh, if you're working on the motor, and if I would have done this stuff in the motor, it would have been in that sort of, workspace and uh i've done it several times and i do controls if there's an easier way to to sort of handle that i'd like to know about that um to kind of just transfer something out from another component that you don't want to another component that you do like want. a feature but yeah yeah exactly I, yeah. i'm sure there's a way for it yeah, probably I, I, see, I, I can't say it right off the top of my head because i've only literally had like maybe a couple hours worth of experience with you right but um I'm pretty sure that's something you can do in SolidWorks and I'm also positive yeah. that you can replicate it as here. Like in SolidWorks, for example, like, and it's not the exact same thing, but you can take a sketch off of one feature, make it uh, uh, what's known as a block. You yeah. grab the sketch and you mm -hmm. make a block out of it. You can save that sketch yeah. as a block and then import it and do all sorts of 
operations from it. Right, right. So ultimately, this motor, you know, just for reference with respect to the Robo Dog, this is going to be one of the shoulder joint motors, correct? Correct. Or, okay. Yes. Um, you can. I can bring up a, a picture of, of Robo Dog too, but uh, you can kind of see it in the left corner right. as well. Um, yeah, one of the shoulder joints so that it kind of goes out mm -hmm. and then forward and backwards. Okay. And uh, you're gonna have two motors, right, per per shoulder per joint. Per shoulder joint. Okay. Yeah. I think in a leg, I was just gonna have three motors total. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, being the knee, right? Yeah. Okay. So everything in total would be twelve motors. So weird. So this is beefy. This thing's gonna be really heavy. It's weird because we're calling it a shoulder, but it's connected to a knee, which makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this sounds good, according to our anatomy, but okay. So I'm actually really interested in hearing about. Uh, how you're going to go about like the skeleton of the dog itself. Cause these things are like you mentioned in your first video, very torquey, right? Yeah. yeah so yeah. you're going to have to be able to create some type of chassis, some mm -hmm. backbone, uh, some type of maybe even like a, I don't know, vertebrae system oh, or maybe yeah, just that, some crazy be, chassis yeah, yeah. that is able to resist all this twisting. So right? I do plan on getting a CNC machine in the future. Um, I've really, I've been, yes, yeah, I've been really wanting one for a while. Um, and I think I'm going to get one here pretty soon. I'm looking at the Tormac. Uh, also for, for context, I should say this about myself. I am by no means a robotics expert. That is Austin Owens. <laughs> That's why I'm on his channel. I'm here to learn. Um, but yes, you I know how to machine though. I do know how to machine. Uh, I do know how to machine. 3D print. I do know how to do CAD. So I have the mechanical skills, but I know, uh, robotics just yet. I love robotics and I guess we can get into that later. You took a class with me. Do you remember that? Yeah, we did. Yes. We took advanced, ago. uh, advanced robotics, robotics systems. Yeah. It was intro into robotic systems, right? Into, yeah. Intro advanced. Were you in the control systems one or the transformation matrices? I think you did the transformation, transformation matrices. matrices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CS 656, I think. Yeah. Or was it five? Yeah, no, 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 it was six. six. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that class was tough. Kicked my butt. Yeah. But it definitely gave me a good insight into, I guess, all the crazy level or high level math that robotics actually, you know, require. Yeah, I liked it so much. I made videos out of it. Yeah, if you guys uh, want to, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you guys want to look at those videos, I made, uh, they're called transformation matrices. You can check them out. But Do you have them uploaded? I do. Oh, wow. Okay. I made them a long time ago. Um, there's three of them and, uh, people really want me to make more Those, That's like my highest, one of the highest viewed videos. People yeah. really like them. It's well, cause you basically explain it. You, yeah. you take concepts that like kind of melt your mind during class <laughs> and you just explain it in a simple manner. Yeah. Um, well, that's how they should be explained. <laughs> which again, I'm not, I'm not here to shill Austin or anything like that, but that's one of the reasons why he's one of my best friends. Like he explains things that melt your mind yeah. in such a way to where like anyone can really understand it. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, explain them in layman's terms. <laughs> like, I, I feel like when professors are so deep into research and theory and have been doing this for I don't know, decades, right? They sort of lose grips with reality. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's what I call they have higher insight, yeah. right? Like Bloodborne. <laughs> not not all professors are like that. But, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely encountered my fair share of, of professors that definitely talk over students heads and right. it's it's very obvious and so you know just speak like a human to them i don't yeah. know speak normal yeah. I, it's not i don't feel like it's that difficult to do but um yeah we're, we're all just people trying to get by right <laughs> so yeah so for context austin is the is the guy with absolutely the most robotics experience that of a person that i know of um, again, I've tampered with robotics, but I only know my only experience with it is primarily just through the club and doing the mechanical end. I've never actually done the programming or worked directly with encoders in the software. So if you guys, if I, if I get caught asking some silly questions, that's <laughs> no. but yeah, man, I'm very interested. Like, again, since I'm mechanical, I'm interested in your chassis, like, because again, yes. when you when you broke down just how torquey these motors are, yeah. and you were talking about two motors per shoulder joint, I was like, dang! Yeah. I was like, I want to see what that mechanical bracket's gonna be like. Yeah, you'd you'd be both. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, what I'm making here for the this adapter is just a prototype. Like this is gonna be made out of plastic right now, uh, just for prototyping. I do not at all intend to have that be the same going forward. It's going to be made out of metal. Everything's going to be or made like out the of first metal. article at least. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, plastic's not good. For, I, I think I even did a uh, 50% for the plate because I wanted to go faster. Well, so okay. I didn't want to. So, so you're not wrong. Plastics, at least, uh, I'm not too sure what your printer uses. Is it ABS? I used ABS for this. Yeah. Year. So ABS, uh, fantastic for brackets and whatnot for holding small things, you know, that have no real, they're not load bearing. Mm -hmm. But there are some plastics that are pretty tell, tell me. phenomenal about that. Yeah, well, give me some name of uh, some plastics. What Here I go. No. <laughs> uh, so at work, I, and again, I'm, you know, disclaimer, I'm no 3D printer expert either. There are people out there that can, you know, take you to the heavens in terms of 3D printer knowledge. But at work, we use a printer by the name of Mark Forged. Uh, many, I'm sure some people listening to this video will have... You know, you heard of Mark Forge, you're familiar with it. But the neat thing, so okay, my experience with Mark Forge, uh, and simple in a simple word, is I absolutely love them. I've dealt with 3D printers before. They were usually, you know, hobbyist level. Mm -hmm. Uh you had to tweak 10 billion settings just to get the part to come out just right and sprinkle some salt in there and all sorts of spices to get the thing to work Sounds right. Familiar. <laughs> um Mark Forge, um, we got them for work. And I don't think those things have stopped printing ever since. And we've had them wow. for years. I, I, I tend to exaggerate things, but no kidding. Like our March Forge printers have printed like thousands of parts and they range from tiny little brackets for small motors or small, you know, uh, boards or whatever to like full on chassis. I'm talking about like, like chassis or sorry, uh, enclosures or just chassis for like larger components. Right. Um, so I bring up Mark Forge to you. Not, not so much because I want you to get one. I plan on like, getting one. Yeah, I'd eventually. like to get one. What's, what's the price range for one of those? So they have two, they have three models of printers, right? So they'll have a desktop version for the like, kind of like hobbyist type stuff. Mm -hmm. They have an industrial, uh, so that's called the Onyx one, the desktop version. Mm -hmm. I think I've heard of on Onyx. Correct. Yeah. Um, they have uh, an industrial series printer called the, uh, it's the X3, X5, and X7. I'll break mm -hmm. down what those what those all mean. And then they have uh, uh, a third um, category called the Metal X, which prints metal, as the name implies. Oh. But you do need like several subsystems, right? So you need yeah. the printer, you need the washing station, which it's funny, all their, their naming, their nomenclature is pretty hilarious. It's like, it's Metal X, the washing station's like Washer 1, and mm -hmm. then like the sintering station is like Sinter 2 or something like that. Yeah, that's actually interesting because some people may be thinking like 3D printing metal, what? Yes. Yeah, it's Absolutely. it's with sintering um, where I think, I, I'm not an expert, but I think that they take like small metal beads or something and then they take a laser to it and then build it up layer by layer, is that? Um, some printers, I believe, go about it like that. Uh, Mark Forge, uh, to my knowledge, what they do is they print in powder. They print mm -hmm. in like metal powder, and um, as the as the printer head is going about its business, it joins the powder with a fusing agent. Oh, and then okay. the fusing um, it's it's kind of strange because the fusing agent is only there temporarily to hold the shape of the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, so it's just injecting this sort of agent into the sort of, yeah, it's not like a full on bath. It's just kind of like dispersing small quantities of it as it lays down the powder Okay. on the layers. But to my understanding is once the agent cures, they wash it. So most of it flows out mm -hmm. and, uh, once it cures though, it holds that shape and then they put it in the center in the centering machine. Mm -hmm. And it cures uh, with you know high heat, high I believe high pressure as well. It's almost like an um, oh my god, like an oven. Uh, what is the industry like oven called? Uh, auto -clave. Oh okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Autoclaves are basically just giant industrial ovens, but um, they use them in like uh, aircraft components and whatnot. But um, it's it's really interesting. But yes, you can totally three D print metal. Um, so I was going to say, yeah, you could do that, but man, those are ridiculously expensive. Yeah. Um, but what I was, the reason I wanted to jump into this is, so Mark Forge uses a proprietary material to print with. They don't just use like a, like your off the, you know, off the shelf ABS or what's the other one? Uh, PLA, PLA or something like that. Yeah, yeah. They use a specific printing material that it's, it's based on nylon 
Mm. And what their, their base level material is called onyx. And it's basically nylon infused with chopped carbon fiber. Interesting. So it gives it a lot of strength, but it primarily gives it, um, well, definitely a lot of strength, but it makes the ear parts way more flexible, right? Mm. So say you got something that is going to have some type of like moment applied to it or some force applied to it at some distance from its center or something like that. Your typical, in my experience, your typical ABS or PLA part will usually snap. Or yep. just be brittle, brittle right? Brittle versus ductile. So there's probably some like flex there's, in there a little bit. There's a there's a solid amount of yeah duct uh, ductile. <laughs> I'm yeah. gonna say that ductility. Ductility, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, no, the part flexes like uh, a good amount, and it's been fantastic. Like in, in all our applications, um, it's I mean none of our stuff is very load bearing, and it's not mm. like it's got creep or fatigue like we don't have crazy moving parts but it's just that added um tactility or that added flexibility um mm -hmm. has been fantastic um but that's just their base level stuff their desktop and industrial uh printers also have a feature called like continuous fiber i believe i'm probably getting all this wrong but what that what's really neat is the Markforge printers allow you to print with composites, AKA fiberglass, um, oh my God, oh, fiberglass, Kevlar, and carbon fiber. Whoa. Yeah, man. It That's is crazy. Awesome. And so make the, bulletproof vests out of Basically, <laughs> I mean, you could, yeah. Or, or like, oh, like bulletproof vest uh, that looks like night armor. Yeah, that'd be that's, pretty, that's that'd crazy. Be pretty How sick. big are these? Are these pretty decent? You um, said that they come in a couple sizes, right? There's like desktops. There's like yeah. So oh, am, am I like spending an arm and a leg for something like that? So actually, yeah, right. Let me get to the bottom line when it comes to price. So the like I said, there's three different categories: the t the tabletop desktop um, version of the printer. Mm -hmm. They're like I said, Onyx ones. Um, those go for about four to five grand i think it's like four to five hundred bucks for one and this is something that can print print like potentially metal no that's not the metal one is it no okay no, okay no. all right, all right. <laughs> i was gonna say i, I know i saw your yeah. eyes light up i saw your eyes totally light up for a second there um no so that's the your base level now that desktop version like that's I said, not bad actually it's, it's, it's not bad. as a starter point yeah i think mine was like around just so for reference i have a bcn 3d printer i think mine cost around i think it was 3500 um but i think that came with all the, like the plastic filaments and stuff like that and i bought a lot like there's a lot of uh yeah, like different types of styles too like there's wood okay. filament okay. and like abs and pla and uh, i even had some nylon filament as well so, oh yeah. man they're in millimeters well okay is that the uh it's the, the it's the print envelope for the um so for context i pulled up the um on the mark forge website the print envelope for the desktop versions um i don't know if you want to pull out your your calculator i'm terrible <laughs> at, at, i'm terrible at converting millimeters, millimeters to inches off the top of my head but I just want to provide people with context because to anyone coming into, you know, the hobbyist 3D printing world, you hear somebody drop, you know, 4,500 or like an amount like 4,500 bucks and you're like, whoa, that's quite a lot. I just want to say for context, you know, most printers, they range from like, I don't know, 1,500 to like 3,000 bucks, right? Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. But hobbyist level printers, and again, there will be many people to, to jump to, um, to the defense of hobbying or hobby 3d printing but it takes a lot of tinkering and uh tweaking of settings to get traditional you know off the shelf 3d printers to print in a consistent and reliable manner and yes. that has been yes. my experience all throughout um you know my my industry experience even my school experience granted this is when 3d printers were still really early mm -hmm. Mark Forge kind of blew my mind. And so we're, to be, and to even be clear, we're specifically talking about FDM printers, filament uh, displacement material. I, oh my God. I, that sounds bad, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's just go with that. But it, they're, these are known as filament uh, or FDM printers, F standing for filament, where they literally have a, what would you call it? A cord 
Um, yeah, yeah, like a, I don't know, like a piece of, I call it like filament. A, yeah, like a so. tube of plastic that gets routed into a printer mm-hmm. head that gets really hot, melts the plastic, right? Lays right. down your foundation. And um, so that's what an FDM printer is. There's, uh, oh my God, I forget what the other, there's other, there's the resin printers that kind of. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I forget yeah. what those are called. I feel terrible. No, they're, re- I think I call them resin printers. <laughs> yeah, but they have like a specific um, name to them. And then there's MJF, which is my favorite. MJF printers, We I can get into, I can get into why I love those later. But uh, a Mark Forge printer is specifically an FDM printer. And the point that I'm trying to make here and what I want to lay out context for is Markforge printers are right off the bat, extremely reliable. Um, yes. Not sponsored. Yeah, not <laughs> sponsored. Yeah, I know, right? Like hashtag not sponsored. Like I, I just say this because I absolutely love these printers. Um, from the moment we got them at work, uh, they basically have not stopped printing. Ha- do they have their problems and issues? Of course, every printer will. But what's neat about them is like most of those issues that you would have in my almost all, all the issues I've had on a Mark Forge printer yeah. have all been really easy to troubleshoot. They always come down to maintenance and some minor mechanical, you know, uh, change that you need to do, like, you know, tuning your belt or sorry, tightening your belts or changing um, the extruder head, so on and so on. Uh, just for reference, uh, the, this size of the printer that you're showing me was this, the desktop version. Yeah, you this wanna... is 584 millimeters by 330 millimeters and 355 millimeters. I'll pull it up. Yeah. Right, I'll, I'll pull it up. Um, but so just so you guys know what I'm doing here, um, I went off to the McMaster car website mm-hmm. and I pulled down some CAD models. This, this is actually another website that gives you CAD models for the stuff that you can potentially buy on that site, which is nice. So this is a um, insert that allows me to have sort of like a threaded uh, internal thread. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it makes it basically a lot more structurally stable when I put in a uh, screw in there. Um, and these fit in by heat, uh, which was interesting. I and mean, they work specifically with plastic parts. Um, and again, I'm, I'm using ABS when I print this out. Um, and it was, this was my first time doing that. And it was actually really cool. Here you can kind of see like the width of the actual insert is wider than the hole itself. And you and specifically want it to be designed that Right, exactly. And I even have some margin there. I made it actually one meter wider because- One, one sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. yeah, one millimeter wider specifically because I know, and this may be something good to talk about, plastic parts shrink. Um, and I had issues with that when I was printing this. Um, and I was talking to you a little bit about it earlier and you were saying, yeah, that's kind of hard to hone in a little bit. Do you have experience trying to print parts like bigger at first to account for the shrinkage later? How how do you even go about doing something like that? So one of the first things we got, uh, or geez, one of the first things we did when we got our Mark Forge printer and. I'll totally throw myself under the bus because I did not go, I did not do a good job about, you know, going about this. But one of the first things we did, and I recommend this to anyone who gets a 3D printer is go into, uh, this is assuming you have access to some type of CAD system, go into your CAD system and create like a flat plate and then split the plate um, in two sections and have one section, call one section Imperial or, you know, uh, Imperial or whatever, and have the other section be called metric. And then on those sections, just add a bunch of um, through holes, you know, or like through holes or tapped holes for um, whatever size you want, right? So like uh, 440 screw, 632, your metric screw, so on, like add all the holes oh, that you I see want. You're and then print it out and see how much each hole shrinks. So what we, and so you use that, you keep that little plate around, like, you know, on your desk so that when you're designing stuff, you can see where certain hole sizes or which hole sizes get impacted the most by shrinkage, right? So in our experience, we noticed that, I wanna say off the top of my head, that holes starting at anywhere between an eighth of an inch and smaller would shrink like crazy. So it's the smaller sort of holes that shrink more exactly. and bigger is less so. Yeah, okay. it, there's almost, there seems to be almost like 
some type of like I guess like I'm, a, I'm gonna call it like wall tension force, right? So the smaller the hole, the tighter mm. and closer that or stronger the tension force becomes. So I, I want to say like as the part is cooling down and, and curing, you know, it just pulls that hole in. Yeah, yeah. But uh, most of that shrinkage was was significantly significantly seen starting at an eighth of an inch or smaller. Now, I maybe. We might get, you know, a couple thousands off for a 316th hole, 530 seconds, so on and so on. But once you get to like a quarter inch hole and higher, like you don't have to really worry about shrinkage. Now, again, for context, that's only, that's main, that's my experience with Onyx material. Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> but on ABS, um, I don't have that much experience with, so you might actually see some shrinkage. Again, that's why I recommend first thing you should do when you get your printer is just create a you know some small flat piece of like a flat model where you can just insert as many holes as you want that you typically would imagine yourself working with right imperial uh metric and then just print it out and see how it works keep some screws with you you know like a m1 m2 m3 so on i imagine i tried doing this with different materials too mm -hmm. right abs yeah. pla um, Absolutely. It's just a it's just a neat little tip thing to do, especially yeah. if you know you're gonna be, you know, messing around with like hobby shit. That's uh hobbies, hobby stuff. This that's what I have over here. Hey, that's um that's not what Rodrigo said exactly, but it's a little kit that has like different uh materials. Yeah, they're calibrated like yeah, yeah, dowels. Right? Exactly. Yeah. They all have the same weight, but they look uh, bigger or smaller according to what material they are. Correct. So uh, that helps me when I'm catting too for some of this stuff. Just have that on my desk and like look at it like, oh, okay, aluminum's gonna weigh this much for this much volume. Yeah. They also have so for anyone that like really wants to get hardcore about it, um, this is more of this is more for meant for machinists, but there's um a, a dowel is essentially like a small cylinder of metal and a cal uh, a calibrated dowel is essentially just um like I mentioned, just a cylinder of metal that is precisely cut to be a specific diameter. Um, and so you keep a set of calibrated dowels in your shop or in your hobbyist room so that you can measure holes precisely, right? So if you need a hole that's has to be exactly 125 thousandths or something like that, right? You grab your one eighth inch dowel and you put it in, you insert it into the hole and you see like if it's got too much slop, if it's too tight, Right, that's not something else you could do with your printed parts. Yeah. Oh man, I love plastic inserts. I'm actually yeah. There's a lot going on. There's, there's I'm actually lot. making a part out of work that is using several like copious amounts of plastic inserts. Really? Are they yeah. heated? You... Uh, we're probably gonna install them that way. Yeah. Like yeah. we haven't even started prototyping it yet, but we're still in the middle of designing it. Um, and this looks awesome. Yeah, I, I did. I did uh, counter bore screws. I think they're M3s or M4s. I can't remember. Uh, but they have screws. I love those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do I have it on here? No, I put it over there. Um, but yeah, counter bore screws, and then on the outside are like counter sinks. Um, Again, another reason why you would want to use so yes, plastic parts are easy to make threaded holes in. Obviously, it's plastic; it gives way a lot easier. But because of that same reason, you tend to tear out and destroy your threaded holes the more you use them. So there's, there's definitely an advantage to going through the trouble of using plastic inserts makes your threaded holes last way longer. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so this is going to be the adapter plate or adapter bracket for what specifically? So this is for another motor. Here in, I think, a couple of minutes, I'm going to bring in the second motor and I'll like show exactly how that's fitting together. Right now, I think I'm just going through the process of doing fillets, <laughs> making nice. it nice so I don't cut my fingers. Right. Um, it You kind of feel it. Um, on the corner of these, which I didn't do a fillet on. Make sure it's really light, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, it's hard to tell when I was catting, yeah. like how deep they actually were gonna go. Like when you're looking at the cat, it looks so much bigger than it actually yeah. is. That's why I always have like a pair of uh, calipers on my desk and I'm just constantly like, okay, it's this big. All right, so it's gonna be this big with my fingers. And, but it's funny. I always, I usually, when I have like a bolt close to a corner, I try and make that corner be concentric. When it comes, when I try and make yeah, the yeah. fillet of that corner be concentric with the bolt, I don't know. Maybe it's just like a, an aesthetics thing for me. Well, I was worried about that too. I didn't want the stress of like the bolt or anything be being too close to the wall of this. Mm -hmm. um, I was worried that if there's like some tension or something like that, um, I'd, I'd uh, 
immediately break the plastic. God, this looks beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I I didn't do the inside of the motor, obviously, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't think I really had to for this. No, you, just you, would make, you would risk making your model extremely heavy. That's true, yeah. And you slow down your uh, software as well. So, oh, okay, I see. So this part is actually, I see. So the bottom part of the shaft coupler is actually part of the plate that you exactly. modeled on. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is actually one piece. <laughs> yeah. um, it took so, this, I think in total for 100% fill was uh, like six hours, but I didn't do 100% fill because I didn't want to wait for six hours and I wanted to go to bed. So I did it for like a little under five hours That's for 50% fill. Um, here, right. here I'm bringing in the second motor. Right. I'm kind of trying Which to... you basically just copied it over from exactly. your 16 feet. Yeah, right? that's the nice thing. It's like you, you try to make all of your parts like the same so you don't have to do extra work in cutting. Um, I would definitely suggest some fillets on the sides of that. Uh, yeah, like that part you had uh, highlighted. Oh, the, uh, the, the little coupling thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, the coupling block, the bottom part of it, I would recommend some fillets on the sides. Just You're talking about right there? Exactly. I do I do kind of have fillets, but I you know, I could have made them bigger for sure. Um, I'm looking I'm looking at the physical part right now and mm -hmm. there's really not much there. So yeah, yeah I would it's hard in to fact, judge, man. It's probably so small to the point where it didn't even matter with the extruder oh, that the, I was using on the yeah, 3D the printer. Resolution. It didn't even matter. So there's like no point of doing it. Sense. But yeah, it's pretty beefy. Um yeah, that's then, why I'm, I'm really interested to see what like your core chassis is gonna look like because it's gonna have to, you know, me mount me these too. things. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe I was gonna use eighty twenty rel at first just to drop Probably. prototype. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then for, go from there. Just for prototyping, eighty twenty rel will give you like all a ton of flexibility. Just mm -hmm. keep in mind it is heavy. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so well, there it is. Um, that's basically the uh, end design. I kind of make it a little bit opaque so you can kind of see the threads inside. Um, I'm a little worried that like this motor was going to slide out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm still sort of worried about that for the final design. It didn't end up doing that because the parts shrunk enough to where it's like clamping on pretty hard. But I think for the actual design, I might want to like extend out, uh, some wings or something, um, so that the motor doesn't slide in and out. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. One thing you could do as well is you have the flat face of the shaft pointing up towards the bolts. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the model turned around and we can't, this is a video, so we can't like, yeah, turn yeah. the video, but on the flat head where you have the bolts going through right smack in the middle, you could make another threaded hole for some type of, um, Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah. Here, oh, here's some pictures okay. of what it what oh. it actually looked like. So this there, is what we have on our desk. This is what we're looking at. So on the left hand side here, where you see the four screws going into the um, the shaft coupler, right? Mm -hmm. Smack that in the middle. You could have a set screw that sits flush oh, against yeah, the yeah, flat yeah. side of the shaft coupler, right? Or the shaft, excuse me. And that way, you could most likely prevent it from spinning. You could also just you know sacrifice the shaft oh, actually never mind take that back there's a cable going right through it i was yeah, gonna say you yeah, could yeah. drill right through it yeah you might be well, perhaps maybe uh, just on the skin of it but then again you would only be holding on by a couple threads yeah wow this looks really clean yeah i'm actually surprised at how well it's holding there me too i was very shocked <laughs> actually when oh. i printed this i was like these motors are really heavy i'm shocked that this part this you know, the base plate is 50% fill. So I'm shocked that it's able to hold up like this. Um, in my previous video that I did uh, that some of you may have just came from, um, you can kind of see me spinning around and, and stuff like that. And it's it's cold in its own. So um, I think this will be fine for like prototype phase. No. Again, I'm gonna, th I'm, gonna um, I'm gonna make this out of metal, but I'm going to see how far I can get with the 3D printed parts because I actually have a 3D printer right now yeah. and that's really all I have. So I'll try to get as far as uh, possible with that. Yeah, uh, so I think you could most likely, yeah, you can easily, if this ends up working for you, you can easily replicate all this, um, you know, for your, what, 12 motors that you're going to be using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's going to be crazy. That's yeah, going to draw so <laughs> much power. Yeah, I need to, I need to talk to some people about the battery management and see what I'm going to do there. Same batteries from the sub. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, that's, dude, that, revenge. that was, that's 
what, 12 pounds per battery or something like that? I was so angry at those batteries because they were so heavy. Uh, what were they? Do you remember? They were like... Yeah, they were lithium. about like 12 to 15. Oh, yeah, the lithium ion for sure. Were they? Yeah, yeah. But they were like 12 to 15 pounds each and they, they each required their own like carriage. Yes, <laughs> so big. So big. Sheet metal carriage that leaked. Yes. Um, in the bottom right, you can kind of see the CAD model. And then what I try to do is above that was like reality. Oh, yeah. So I was trying to match them up and I'm like, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of similar, right? Yeah, it looks exactly the same yeah. in my opinion. That's what I love about like CADing and, and 3D printing stuff or ma manufacturing stuff in general. It's like, it's so cool to go from a design for uh, in your head to something in reality. I can never get over that no matter how many times I do this. That's one of the funnest parts, yeah. yeah. And we've come, like, this stuff has gotten so good that it's almost, like, one-to-one. -one. I mean, like, look at the model and look at the yeah. real-life yeah. assembly. That looks, that almost, if you blur your eyes a little bit, it almost looks like a render. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> like a yeah, render a inside Fusion. Yeah. And this came out great, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, I, I, I am, I would recommend adding those fillets just to, like, because I would stress. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I just yeah. wouldn't want this part to snap off. I, you know what? Um, That's probably what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe you can make like a an, an addendum to this video showing like the fillets and what I mean specifically. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm actually quite shocked that like, again, for those who haven't like held these motors, they're, they're really beefy. They're pretty heavy. And just the fact like that middle picture, um, the thing's holding on and it's not tipping over. I thought for sure it would tip over, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, are you going to say I'm wondering because again... So let's get to the, uh, let's go back to basics, right? So you want to make an open source version of the Boston Dynamics spot dog, correct? Kind of, kind of. I mean, it's uh, kind of replicated from that or rather inspired from right. it. Um, and uh, I think this is probably going to be a little bit bigger than that. Uh, but I've always liked the way how it seemed so smooth when it moved. Mm. And my sort of expertise really lies in algorithm development and software and computer engineering. And, um, you know, I, I took mechanical engineering and I'm, I know enough to be dangerous in electrical and mechanical for sure. But um, I, I kind of wanted a platform so that I can sort of make the robotic movement smoother. And so develop those control system algorithms and develop uh, trajectory planning and generation um, paths for the uh, for the for the uh, the legs of the robo dog to move. And ultimately, you can get things almost so smooth that it looks fluid or like almost human like. And I'd, I'd like to get it to that point. Yeah, spot looks unreal. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really like that. And uh, I'm going to try to work towards that. And if I could pull it off, hopefully this would be you know, cheaper than spot. <laughs> yeah. And like, again, from my limited knowledge and from what you've taught me, I mean, most of that like magic esque control of say specifically spot, when you see it in the promotional videos, that primarily comes down to extreme encoder, um, control or not mo extreme motor control through the most precise encoders you could ever. Imagine, yeah. I'm right? sure they're super precise encoders. I'm sure that, um, they've really tweaked and fine tuned their algorithms. Yeah. Insane amount of feedback loops with their super precise PIDs. Right. Yeah. I'm, you know, once you get to like doing quadrupeds and stuff like that, I think you could use PIDs. They use a lot of that in industry, but um, that's more for like linear systems. Mm, and so okay. if you want to start getting into like really modeling reality, Full you go to nonlinear no. control systems right. where you don't do PIDs, but you do like, uh, there's other methods that you can right. do. They get crazy. Uh, nonlinear control systems is still a field that's being explored right now. Right. So you, uh, you, <laughs> You lay out all your components, all your you lay out your system, and you figure out your solution for it. Yeah. Um, do you think? Because I, I remember watching the promotional video, and I was of course blown away. Um, I don't think this is the case, but do you think they're using some type of um, shoot? What's the word? Um, gyro to keep it stable or maybe balance of any kind. You know what I'm I mean? Not, yeah, I know what you mean. I I'm not. I don't think so i'm not sure though i know that for their bigger dogs they have like a lidar that spins super fast that mm. kind of captures everything uh but for a gyroscope to kind of stabilize it i don't think 
they have something like that. I haven't, I haven't seen the internals of Spot before. Exactly. So. I could have sworn that Atlas, right? They're humanoid mm -hmm. or they're biped humanoid. Do they have something robot. inside of it to yeah. kind of stabilize I'm it? I'm pretty sure that they're using, or maybe I'm just, you know, maybe I, I might be completely wrong. I don't even know if they they have their specs online or I know they just got bought by a Korean company. And they were bought by it? SoftBank, but <laughs> I don't know if SoftBank is... I don't know what they're doing with it. Yeah, do you know if they're going to commercialize it? Uh, they've they've already started. Actually, I think Spot's been sold by few, by, by some people, or been purchased by some people, rather. But like, do you know if it's going to be, I guess, uh, available to like your everyday consumer? Or is it just going to be, say, I for think, example, I think it is. Wow. I think it okay. is. So yeah, see, initially when you first told me about this project, I thought that's what you wanted to do. You're like, wow, they're going for that? I'm going to create an <laughs> open source, cheaper version, right? I Yeah, yeah. Um, I just, I, I love robotics and I wanted to be able to share it with people that I think that was more of the bottom line. And like, if I can help people and show them that this is actually not as hard as they think it is, uh, I'm hoping more people will get into this type of stuff because I think the world needs it. I'm going to be right there with you because <laughs> I, I'm the biggest, I'm going to throw myself right under the bus and say I'm the biggest hack because I love robots. I grew up with Gundam. I grew up with Armored Core, Metal Gear, Zone of the Enders, every mecha anime from the 80s and the 90s and i'm and like the reason why i went into mechanical engineering is because like i want to make robots and i haven't really ever made one i know the sub we build it together but yeah. it's like i don't really count that just because it's like i only stayed in what i would call my corner which is like ooh cad and and like prototyping and fabrication i didn't work with the motor i didn't work with encoders i didn't write any code you're definitely exposed to it yeah that's where you start it, yeah. that's absolutely where you start so like when you started this series it's like oh man you gotta fill me in like right now <laughs> I, actually, I actually feel really privileged because it's like so you have your audience but then like i get front row seats like i might as well have popcorn right now <laughs> right i get like front row seat to like this this project and i get to actually touch it yeah um, you, you see how how many ways i can fail before i can try to rub a die yeah i like i get I mean, I hope I get to see behind the scenes with the code because again, yeah, for sure, I'm that's... gonna open source all this stuff. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. Um, but we're this, you know, we've gone a little bit over an hour. Uh, <gasps> yeah, it's, it's uh, time flies. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap it up a little bit. So um, Rod, is there any uh, any any way that uh, the audience can find you if they want to know more about you? Uh. So I was telling Austin, I don't necessarily have a full on, uh, what would you call it, I guess, footprint online. I, obviously, I do have social media accounts and whatnot. I'm not a content creator, maybe just yet. I yeah. plan it, maybe yeah. this year. Uh, I'm not a full on content creator. Some, some uh, machining stuff. I, uh, I guess I could. Um, yeah. Like I said, I'm not a full on content creator yet, so I don't have like a full on, what would you call it, handle and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, I am on Twitter. Uh, what do you call it? What do you say, like the at? Yeah, that, right. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I've never done this. So, oh yeah, I guess for also for context, this is my first time ever making a or being part of a YouTube video of any kind. So there's that. But my Twitter handle is at Camphor1989. Camphor is spelled K A M P F E R 1989. The numbers. Um, for anyone who's a Gundam fan, they would immediately recognize that. It's, it's a mobile suit from Gundam 0080. Anyway, um, and then on Instagram, it's... Uh, and I feel unprofessional even mentioning <laughs> this one. On Instagram, this is not a professional account at all by any means. But I uh, and I am on there as... Uh, you, you know, it's probably best if you just, like, put a link down below. Sure, sure, sure. Me, I'll, like, I'll put links. On wording this sure. out seems really silly, but it's... RLA eighty nine dot Zeke dot Pride. It's, it's all Gundam stuff. I'm a huge nerd for Gundam, but yeah, if anyone wants to throw a follow or whatever, uh, you can find me on there. I like I mentioned to Austin. Uh, I think 2021 is gonna be the year where I kind of more than just dip my toe into the pool of content creation. I'd actually be interested. Um, you also work in your car and stuff like that. You put that stuff up there. I, yeah, I should have. You know, I should have actually filmed me making. I'm sure you'll make several more changes to your car. <laughs> or, or just when I was working on the GTR wing. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's like, I should have filmed the beginning of that, but whatever, I missed the boat on that. But as far as, like, when I say content creation, like, Austin, four years has been working on robots left and right. Um, 
and now with this one, he is now trying to record it right. So he's inspiring me to potentially do the exact same, more like bullying me into it. <laughs> into doing it. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, uh, I've always, like I mentioned before, I've always been a massive fan of Gundam and Armored Core. Um, and I would, with my skills, I would love to be able to create my own, you know, uh, robot kits and possibly equip them with womb motors and LED lights and just use those projects as a platform for me, you know, being a mechanical gearhead to get into coding, to get into electrical. Cause like, man, those are fields that I bear. I mean, I've worked with them, but I've never, you know, put together a circuit or anything like that. Right. So I'm hoping I can use this platform as something that will like really propel me into those fields. And with Austin here, I'm going to ask him a million questions. Of course. Be happy to answer. So yeah, you guys can try and follow me, find me on there. Um, if not, it's okay. I'll, I'll continue <laughs> being a guest here. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll do other, uh, sort of podcasts like this, uh, but anyways, thank you guys for, uh, tuning in. I know this was kind of one of my longer videos, but, uh, yeah, thank you guys. We'll, um, I'll try to put out the next video here pretty soon. Yeah. So uh, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Austin. Appreciate it, yeah, man. Of course.